You know, I was thinking about uh, Paul's ministry. We talked, he talked about his ministry in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that we looked at this morning. There's great contrast there between the ministry of Moses under the Old Testament law and the ministry of Paul under the New Testament uh, arrangement. But you know, I would venture to say that it is likely that if Paul would be ministering today, he would not be considered very successful by anyone. Think about it. He was never a homeowner. Aren't pastors supposed to be homeowners? <laughs> by the way, we didn't have a home. We never owned a home for 40 years of our marriage. We just uh, became a homeowner after her mother passed away and left a little bit of an inheritance to my wife. You don't have to be a homeowner to, to be successful, but he was never a homeowner. In fact, Paul never even had a permanent address. He never had a permanent residence. Oh, by the way, neither did Jesus, and neither was he. Here's something. Paul was a church planning pastor, but guess what? He never built a church building. How could he do that? He, he was a church planner, but he never built a church building. Oh, I thought that was part of the job description. Paul also was bivocational so that he could support himself. He was never full-time supported as far as finances are concerned. And you know what he said about himself? He admitted that he was not a good speaker. He admitted that he was a fearful and uh, that he was a very weak man and poor speaker. And we are told also that his physical appearance was not very impressive. He wasn't a, a, a strikingly handsome man. So would he be successful on the basis of what we say success is? His recommendation, his reference letter, the recommendation that Paul had was not some document that he would produce written by people that were well-known in Christian circles. You know, when you buy a book, you read all these recommendations by this guy, oh, famous. They would never ask me to write a recommendation because no one knows who I am, right? So they get these... these uh, these bright lights to write recommendations so that the book will be more readily available and received. Well, you know what Paul's recommend, recommendation was? The people that he ministered to. The lives that God changed through his ministry. The lives that God touched. In fact, he says, as we read in that first verse, he says to this church, you want a letter of recommendation? You want a reference from me? Look at yourselves. You're my recommendation letter. You're my reference letter, is what he says in that first verse. And then he said, not only that, he said, Christ wrote you in our hearts. And in verse 3, and you are a recommendation letter, a reference letter for Jesus himself. That's what he says in that third verse. You are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us. Christ wrote a reference letter in your hearts. It's called the gospel that you received. And he did not use ink. Look at verse 6. He did not use ink nor did he carve it into stone tablets, but he wrote it with the spirit of the living God in the fleshy tables of your heart. Christ wrote my recommendation letter in your heart. It's called the gospel. And he used Holy Spirit ink. And by the way, he says, I'm just the delivery boy. I'm just the mailman. I'm just the one that delivered the letter, the gospel. What Paul would have us to understand, there are two, I, I would call them 
overarching truths in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And I want to give them to you up, up front and then look at them a little closer. The first overarching truth, really, not just in 2 Corinthians 3, but this is an overarching truth of the entire Bible that God wants every one of us to learn. You've heard it before, I guarantee it. And it's this truth. He wants us to learn God dependence. And that's what Paul says in the fourth and fifth verse. He says, and such trust have we through Christ to Godward. In other words, I am depending upon God. And then verse 5, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. What is he saying? He's saying, I want you to learn what I have learned, and that is that believers are to be God-dependent people. We are to live and serve God by depending upon him and not ourselves, that we are not sufficient for this task, but he is. It's God-dependence. And that's what the New Testament is all about. The New Covenant is a new provision that didn't exist under the law of Moses. It's a new way to live. It's a new way to serve God. It's totally new. And it is a God dependence. It's trusting God's competence and not your own. Beware of thinking that you are a competent person when it comes to living the Christian life or when it comes to serving the Lord. You have to depend upon God's competence and not your own. Where do you and I get the ability to impact anybody, to impact any of those people around us for God? Where do we get that ability? Be is it uh, because we have an ability to be articulate? Is it because we have a, a powerful personality that ju just uh, rolls over people? Where do we get the ability, I mean, to really impact people? I'm not talking about impressing people. I'm talking about impacting them inside in their heart. It's God competence. You don't get that ability to impact the people around you by attending a Bible college necessarily or going to uh, Christian Bible seminars or by possessing a personal, uh, a, a powerful personality or having certain natural abilities. Paul said that everything that happened through him was God at work through his life. Is that how you view, is that how you view your daily life and service for the Lord? Anything that impacts people, anything that I do that's good, it's because I'm dependent upon God. I'm looking at his competency and not my own. It's God competence. Now, if anyone had perhaps an opportunity to be self-confident and not trust God's competence, it would be this man, Paul the Apostle. But that's not how he feels. He says uh, in verse 6, God made us able servants of the New Testament. God made us that. But, you know... Just humanly speaking, Paul was an unusually, unusually competent personality. You read Paul and you get the impression this guy is, he's an intellect. He's, he's intellectual. And his personality is powerful. And he is a man that is certainly filled with zeal. He's all over the map. <laughs> 
literally, geographically. He's all over the place. He's so filled with zeal for the gospel, for Christ. But something's changed in this man. I want you to, for a moment, keep a, keep a finger in 2 uh, Corinthians 3. Jump back to a couple of books to Philippians 3. From 2 Corinthians to Philippians 3. In Philippians chapter 3, you know what? Paul begins to tell us a little bit of what he trusted in before he met Christ. Before he got saved, when he was practicing Judaism, you know what Judaism represents? We said it this morning, it represents self-effort. The old covenant, you're trying to obey God in your own power, by your own strength, your own energy. Sadly, Christians try to do that too. But this is what Judaism is. And Paul was the cream of the crop when it came to Judaism. And we get a little picture of that in verse 5 of Philippians 3, when he tells us a little bit about his past life. He says in verse 5, I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews. I mean, I was a Jew of the Jews. And as touching the law, a Pharisee. Now, let's just stop there a moment and think about Paul's natural competency here. First of all, I mean, it's a great, re it's a great resume if you're applying for uh, a job uh, of this sort. Look at his resume here. First of all, he talks about his ancestry, how he was well-bred. He was from good stock. He had tremendous Jewish heritage. Uh, he, so he talks about his ancestry, and then in that fifth verse, he also mentions his orthodoxy as a Jew. He says that uh, as touching the law, he was a Pharisee. So he was the cream of the crop when it came. He was a religious fanatic. He observed the Pharisees observe, observe Jewish law to legal minutia. I mean, they would even tithe seeds that would be planted. Before they planted them, they would tithe their seeds. They would took, uh, take a tenth of their little seeds and uh, tithe them to the Lord. So this guy, he's his ancestry, his orthodoxy. But look at what he says in verse 6. Concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. I persecuted the church. His activity, he was incredibly zealous Pharisee with his goal of stamping out anything that Judaism would have considered a heresy. And there was a sect of Judaism called the Way of the Nazarenes, which was followers of Jesus, and he was out to rid Judaism of that sect completely. His activity, he was zealous. But look at verse 6 again. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, I was blameless. So his resume, uh, resume even includes some great morality. What he's saying here, I had a spotless, clean record in outward morality. No one could truly accuse me by observing my, my outward life. So he had ancestry going for him, uh, orthodoxy, great activity, zealous, and morality. And yet, <laughs> Paul learned a painful lesson. Go back to 2 Corinthians 3. He learned a painful lesson. In Philippians 3, he goes on to say this. He said, you know what? I came to a point when I realized all of that was garbage. All of that was trash. All of that was trafe. All of that was refuse. All of that you could throw in a dunghill on a manure pile. It didn't amount to anything when it came to impacting people for the Lord. All of my qualifications, all my self-confidence, he said, I threw it out the window. I got rid of it. I, I, I just abandoned it. 
And he learned that painful lesson, and he talks about it in the entire seventh chapter of Romans. How he tried to use his self-effort, and it just brought defeat and just messed him up. And brought him to a place where he said, God, if you don't deliver me, I don't know what's going to happen to me. So, Paul could have been very self-confident. And I think when he lived under the old covenant, as he as he did prior to his meeting Christ on that road to Damascus, he was depending upon that. But he learned through experience and through God's revelation of himself to Paul that all of this is absolutely worthless to make you holy. You can look holy on the outside, but none that you can do in your own effort can make you holy within. And that's what's really important because that's where holiness begins. It begins inside and it, it's not cleaning up the outside. It's not reforming your life. It's not turning over a new leaf. It's God makes you holy within. You know what the law does? You know what it did for Paul and uh, all the Jewish people under the old covenant? It awakened rebellion in them. When, when You know how it is that when you see a sign, do not, that you want to do what it says you shouldn't? That's, the, that's a picture of the law. It says thou shalt not, and so it, is, it arouses and, and it awakens rebellion in the human heart. That's the way we're, we're wired because we're fallen creatures. And that rebellion kills motivation. We have no power to impact people spiritually apart from God competence, which means we are God dependent. We're putting our dependence upon him. That's what the new covenant is all about. That's what Paul's talking about here in 2 Corinthians 3. The old covenant is do your best. The new covenant, it's, it's not your ability to do something for God, but rather you just show up and you present yourself uh, to the Lord and then you depend upon him to work through you and God achieves what he demands of you, he achieves that through you. So in the end, he gets the credit and not you and not me. Does that make sense? It's God dependence. It's not confidence in yourself. It's not self-confidence. It's God competence. And it's the result of what we might call an inner residence. That is, God lives in us. The Old Covenant, it was an external commandment. It was carved in stone, the Bible tells us, by the finger of God. You know those ten, ten Commandments? They were carved in stone by the finger of God. Not the New Covenant, not the New Testament. God himself, rather than carving the New Testament in stone like the Old Testament, rather than that, God himself went into your heart. With his finger, he didn't carve in stone. With his person, he entered into your heart. He entered into your life. And uh, he did so with a record of his love for you and his willing sacrifice for you and his plan to forgive you all of your sin and as a result to free you from all your guilt. God himself took up personal and permanent residence in you and fills you with a sense of his everlasting love and approval of you. He enters into your heart and he gives you a sense that you are dear to him, that he cherishes you, and he forms within your heart new desires, gives you different motivation, and gives you his power. That's what 2 Corinthians 3 is all about. You want to impact people? God dependence. And you know what? When you're living in God dependence, Jesus is not only reflected, but he is seen in you and, your, and, and his life will radiate through you. 
That's the rest of the chapter, verses 12 through 18. Uh, notice, first of all, in verse 12, seeing then we have such hope. Talk, that, that he's talking about New Testament believers. We have a hope that Old Testament believers never had. We have such a better covenant. He says, we have such hope. We use boldness or plainness of speech. Not as Moses. Look at this. Not like Moses, who is really the key figure in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, right? Not as Moses, which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. You know what that veil represents? It's symbolic. That veil is a symbol of the Old Covenant with all of its demands upon uh, Israel. And uh, the natural human response to the demands that God puts upon Israel through the commandments is that you try to obey. So that veil, Moses' veil, really is a symbol of the personal attraction of a human being to the law of God by trying to obey it. Now, Moses put a veil, he put a mask on. Remember a couple years ago, everyone was walking around with masks on their face? Moses was walking around with a mask on his face. He was masked up. That's what we're told in verse 13. You can read the background of that in Exodus chapter 34, but we're not going to turn there. The reason he masked up is because when he came after 40 days, came down from Mount Sinai with the, the tablets of stone, his face was glowing with a reflection of the glory of God whose presence he was in for over a month. His face was shining. It was glowing. And it was scary to the people that looked at him. Moses' face was shining. It, it really, that it, it's the shining face of Moses is a, a symbol of an external attraction to the law of God that you attempt to keep the law. You know why Moses masked up? Well, we are told in Exodus 34 that he masked up because the the the, uh, the people were afraid. And so he put a veil over his face so they wouldn't be afraid of his shining face. It, it was a supernatural glow, right? It was a, really a physical glowing of his skin. That would scare me. It wouldn't scare you. So he put a veil on. He put a curtain on his face. He masked up so they wouldn't see that. They wouldn't be afraid. But you know what Paul tells us here? In verse 13, Paul basically says, you know, another reason why he put that mask on? He put that mask on. He masked up and made that mask a status symbol. That mask set him apart as a special mediator between Israel and God. And so he masked up, not just because the people feared his shining face, but he masked up because himself, he feared that he would lose the people's attention. He masked up in fear to protect his position because the bright attraction that gave him power, he knew was fading away. You see that? That's what verse 13 is telling us. And then in verses 14 and 15, Israel's mask, Israel's veil, is the same thing that Moses' veil stood for. It happened to Israel as a nation. Just as Moses' mask hid, hid the fading glory of God, so Israel has a mask or a veil or a curtain over their heart, over their mind. And so 
they can't see the glory of God. So they believe if they try hard enough to keep their list of do's and don'ts from God, they'll please him. And when they do a good job, they feel good about themselves because they're masked up and they're hiding behind, uh, they're hiding behind their good works. They're hiding behind their religion. And, uh, and the end of all self-effort is really a mask. It's not reality. It's a mask. Uh, it's hiding the futility of trying by your own effort to keep the law. It's hiding the emptiness and the condemnation that it brings and the death that it results in. It kills. That's what this chapter tells us. So, what's the answer? That mask is personal attraction. It's to attract people to you. What's the answer? The answer is a spiritual transfiguration. And that's what verses 16 to 18 are about. Not about personal attraction, but a spiritual transfiguration. He says, nevertheless, when it, referring to Israel or anyone that turns to the, whose heart turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away, the mask is removed, and then they can see the truth, they can understand. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty, there's freedom. And, and by the way, we all, believers, he's talking to, we all with an unveiled face, with an open face, Beholding as in a window or a, a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed. Literally, the word is transfigured like Jesus on that mountain. We are transfigured into the same image of, of God's glory from one degree of glory to the next degree of glory and on and on and on by the Spirit of the Lord. Spiritual transfiguration. Here's, here's how you impact people. By God dependence, but secondly, by God radiance. By God radiance. By the radiance of God coming out from your life. Letting his glory shine into you. So that his glory then can shine out from you. In verses 16 and 17, it's talking about salvation, which is a gift. The Holy Spirit makes Messiah Jesus visible, clear and plain, allowing faith to unmask our human hearts. So we accept the gift of salvation. We accept Jesus. Uh, so we depend upon Messiah Jesus. And when we do so, we experience freedom with nothing to hide because you don't have guilt anymore. Sin's been forgiven. You have God's gift of forgiveness. You have a clean heart. You have his righteousness, his acceptance, his approval, and you are now forever pleasing to God. You, uh, positionally, you are a new person. But in verse 18, Spiritual transfiguration, it begins with the gift of salvation, but it continues progressively by glory. Look at what he's saying. While positionally you're a new person, what he says in verse 18 is practically and, pro and progressively you're becoming a new person. Positionally, you are a new person, verses 16 and 17. But practically and progressively over a period of time, you are becoming a new person. So what you are in God's sight is what you are becoming as you with an unveiled, unmasked face stare into and gaze upon the glory of God in the scripture. The process happens as long as you're not staring at Moses' face, the veiled old covenant, but rather than self-effort, you're fixed on your eyes are fixed on the glorious of the glory of Jesus. 
It's a God dependence. The Holy Spirit then is transfiguring you. You see, here it is. You have to see the glory of Jesus in the scripture. And then you have to depend upon him to transfigure you through what he shows you of himself. When you are shown by him, when he reveals who he is and what he can do or what he's done, and you depend upon him to do that for you, you're transfigured. I'm not going to go into it again, but I explain what transfiguration is. It's more than just reflecting Jesus in your life. That's why I'm glad the King James Version uses the word glass and not mirror as the modern translations do because I think it gets closer to the real meaning of this verse. Because when you in the scripture see Jesus, you're not just looking at a mirror to reflect him. It, it, you, it, it's, it's actually not the, the glass here is not uh, the scripture. The glass is you. And it's when, when, when you see the glory of God, understand who he is and what he does. You know what happens? Your life becomes a glass. It becomes transparent. And, and the glory of God is, is transfigured. You're transfigured. The glory of the transfigured Christ is visible. When people look at you, they'll see the transfigured Christ, his glory. And it, you will outshine. You'll outshine the glory of Christ and have that impact upon people around you. Does that make sense? I, it's hard for me to make this clear. But this, this is incredible truth. If you understand, God's at work. It's a gradual, supernatural transfiguration that he's doing in, in Christian lives that will expose themselves to the presence and glory of Christ. How do you do that? How do you expose yourself to the presence of Christ? Well, you take time to get along with him. And, and you do that every day. But sometimes, but sometimes you, you have to take special seasons where you get away from everyone and everything else and, and and you don't worry about your, your device. You don't worry about anything. You don't worry about food. You just, you just get in his presence and you have a, a personal encounter with a glorious Jesus. And as a result, there's a transfiguration that supernaturally happens in your heart and life. You're supernaturally transfigured, transformed, changed. You deepen your love for Jesus. It's the result of his love being put in you, and you begin to love like him. The Holy Spirit removes that veil from you, and you see the futility of self-effort, and you see your true identity in Jesus. And so when you do, you experience the great security. You have his peace and joy because this is who you are in him, and you understand the power it is not I but Christ. Questions about this? Yeah. It's impossible because the veil seems like such a negative thing. If that was a prophecy that Israel would be blinded. It is a prophecy that Israel would be blinded because they didn't want to see. Yeah. And the veil is a negative thing. It is a negative thing. In this passage in 2 Corinthians 3, shed the veil. Get rid of the mask. Stop masking up. See Jesus for the glorious person that he is. That he might transfigure you. That your life would reveal that glorious Jesus. As people look at you and you shed the radiance of his glory to others. You impact them that way. Yeah. Yes. Say that. Yeah. Well. Yeah. In a in a sense, it was. 
Yeah. In a sense, it was. I think what Paul is telling us in verse 13 of chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians is that he did it for selfish purposes. He did it because he feared that they would see that the glory that they were afraid of wasn't going to be there, and then he would lose his position of power over them. Yeah. yeah it's interesting. That's what I was thinking about. That. The fact that if the glory faded, he could have taken away the veil and just, you know, it would have taken humility. It would have taken a, a real sense of, you know what, I have to get back with the Lord. But I think we do that as well. Uh, absolutely. You know, because if we're not spending time with the Lord, then there's nothing reflecting us. And so we also have that veil. If we're spending time yeah. with the Lord, you can tell that somebody's with the Lord. Right. You know, like mm -hmm. the, the book of Acts, they say they knew that they had been with Jesus yeah. because of their actions, how they treated each other, how they cared about each other. And so it's the same way. If if Moses was as humble as the Bible says, and then, you know he's a human being like all of us, so we can't hold anything against him. But he would have, you know, he would have seen the glory fade. He would take it off. He would have entered back into the, the the tabernacle. He would have received the glory again, covered it up when it went up. Then he would have shown the people his humility and, and the fact that this is temporary. That would have really shown the people that that the law was a temporary thing. It would have sure. been another picture of that future. Yeah, Lord. and that's another reason why it was wrong. Because the veil, it the veil did not reveal to the feet to the people that the glory of the old covenant was fading and it was going to be replaced by the new covenant. It was a symbol. And he messed up the symbol. Just like he did when he struck the rock the second time instead of speaking to it like God told him to. He messed up the symbol. And that's important. That's significant with God. Yeah. But but that's this is the point. The point is whenever we come whenever we we pass ourselves off as as Christians and, and yet we haven't really been exposed to the presence and the glory of Christ. We're a bunch of hypocrites. We got masks on. That's what I'm saying. We need to unmask. Take your mask off. Take the veil off. Get in and by the way, Moses, he would put that veil on when he was with the people. But when he went back into the tabernacle to communicate with God, he'd take it off so that he'd get a, a, a new uh, glow about him. Then he put the veil on when he came out.